It was not uncommon in the 1950s for spectators to be killed. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're examining the historical accuracy of Michael Mann's Ferrari. You should assign me control of your stock in the company and the freehold uh, so I can deal. Number 10, the cars, right. When we get in the cars, the camera's handheld, and it's in the passenger seat next to the driver, and you feel the road noise, and you feel the dust on your face. Director Michael Mann is well known for his commitment to authenticity, with his films often foregoing CGI in favor of practical effects and gritty realism. Ferrari is no different. Mann's movie beautifully recreated the vehicles used in the 1957 Mille Miglia, including the Ferrari 315S and Maserati 450S. This is an era in which the cars, particularly the Ferraris, made a tremendous amount of power. Some of the vehicles were built specifically for the movie, including Eugenio's Ferrari 801 Grand Prix, while others were rented, such as the Maserati 250F. Whether originals or meticulous recreations, the cars were period accurate and beautiful to look at. I've always loved this era in motorsports. It's the most romantic, probably the most tragic and dangerous period. Number nine, Enzo Ferrari, mixed. Enzo's relentlessness and ambition and myopic focus, I completely understand. While Adam Driver is fantastic as Enzo Ferrari, the portrayal deviates in some ways from what we know of the real motor racing driver and entrepreneur. For example, the real Enzo Ferrari did not speak English. He spoke Italian, of course, and was conversant in French. We understand why Mann changed this for the movie, but unfortunately, Driver's clipped Italian accent veers a little too far into Mario territory. You have perhaps a crisis of identity. Am I a sportsman or a competitor? The film may have exaggerated his cold-hearted nature. While Enzo Ferrari was competitive and ruthless in business and an autocratic leader, he's also remembered as a complex man who was driven primarily by passion. He was different with everybody. He was different with the women in his life. He was different with customers. Your Highness. Which Highness? Than he was with racers. That Highness. You get out to the track. Number eight, the locations. Right. A thousand miles across bad roads with sheep and dogs, anything can happen. Michael Mann took great care in crafting the film's setting. It would have been easy to film in California or even worse in front of a green screen. But as we said, Mann is a stickler for authenticity. So he packed his bags and headed to Italy to film at real locations. Me and me, it was a thousand mile race across open roads through mountains, through towns, through Ravenna, the outskirts of Rome. Many of the settings were genuine, including the various sites visited by the 1957 Mille Miglia. Mann also shot at many different locales in and around Modena, including the historical center, the monumental cemetery of San Cataldo, and even Ferrari's real barbershop. It's not simply the place, the furniture, the wardrobe, what the streets look like, and all that detail, which is terribly important, but it's also period accurate. Number seven, Enzo's attitude towards streetcars and drivers, right. Ferrari was the man who had been a race car driver to begin with. His sole purpose in life is racing. Ferrari is one of the biggest names in the auto world, and owning one is a status symbol. Yet Ferrari himself didn't care a lick about his streetcars or their reputation. And in this way, the movie is absolutely correct. By all accounts, Ferrari made his famous street cars because he needed to fund his racing cars. Jaguar races only to sell cars. I sell cars only to be racing. We are completely different organisms. He did want status, but only on the racetrack. And when it comes to racing, his one and only interest was the cars themselves. Ferrari driver Nicky Lauda has said that, quote, Ferrari's only interest was winning. He really didn't care about the drivers. Ferrari accountant Carlo Bensi also claims that Enzo privately credited his cars for the wins, not their drivers. And the reason people think about Ferrari the way they do is because it ultimately is about the car and not the driver. Number six, Enzo's secret son, mixed. Because you were so consoled at Castelvetro, you lost your attention. You had another boy growing stronger while Dino was getting weaker. What goes on in your mind? It's true that Enzo Ferrari kept his son Piero a secret. The film makes it seem as if Ferrari's wife, Laura Garello, was responsible for the secret. Laura tolerates Ferrari's affairs, but she draws the line at Piero and tells Enzo that he cannot acknowledge Piero as his son until after she dies. Una era uh, la moglie Laura e il figlio Dino che era scomparso l'anno precedente e la seconda in reality, it wasn't Laura that kept Enzo from Piero, but Italy. 
At the time, divorce was illegal in the country. Enzo was not allowed to leave Laura, nor could he legally recognize Piero as his son. But Laura died in 1978, allowing Enzo to adopt Piero. It destroyed him! It destroyed us! What do you care? Huh? You have another son! You have another wife! She's not my wife, but he is my son. Number 5. Alfonso de Portago's Crash. Right. That he should be killed on the threshold of a magnificent racing career is a great loss to racing and to the world of people who still retain an ounce of romance in them. Ferrari ends in dramatic fashion, with Gabriel Leone's Alfonso de Portago crashing at the Mille Miglia. Portago refuses to change his tires and later suffers a blowout, causing his car to crash and kill multiple bystanders. Unfortunately, this was not made up for the film. On May 12, 1957, Portago suffered a blowout at 150 miles per hour and crashed into the crowd lining the highway. The car left the road, somersaulted, hit the bank and disintegrated. De Portago was killed. Edmund Nelson, his navigator, was also killed. Nine spectators were killed. Nine spectators were killed, as were Portago and his co-driver Edmund Nelson. This devastating event tarnished the reputation of the Mille Miglia, which was already considered extremely dangerous. It came to an end following the Portago crash and has not been raced since. The Mille Miglia was a thousand mile race around Italy on normal roads with millions of spectators lining the roads. And it was incredibly dangerous. Number four, the fallout from the crash. Wrong. The Mille Miglia was never run again. That was one thing. But beyond that, there was a manslaughter charge. Perhaps the biggest omission from the film is the manslaughter charge that Ferrari faced after the Portago crash. In the film, Ferrari is publicly blamed for the deaths and his reputation takes a hit, but he doesn't face any significant penalties. If Anthony is looking for a scapegoat, then here I am. In real life, both Ferrari and the tire manufacturer Engelbert were charged with manslaughter. The criminal prosecution was very lengthy and public, and only dismissed several years after Portago's 1957 crash in 1961. If Ferrari were a miniseries, this case would have certainly been included. As it is, Mann decided to leave it out of the film. There was an air of revulsion, and the Vatican was horrified. Number three, Ferrari's business dealings. Wrong. This is Enzo Ferrari, the Ferrari who makes some of the fastest and most expensive cars in the world. It's not just the manslaughter case that Ferrari glosses over. It also takes a few liberties with Ferrari's business decisions. In the movie, Enzo tells a reporter to run a fake story about Ford potentially buying Ferrari. In fact, Ford really was considering this, but in the 1960s, after the movie's timeline. He played us. Old man Enzo had no intention of selling to us. He used us to up his price. Enzo Ferrari backed out when Ford wouldn't promise him control of the company's racing department. By the end of the movie, Ferrari's financial troubles have seemingly disappeared. But Ferrari's commitment to racing was quite financially burdensome. It was made a public company in 1960, and in 1969, 50% of its shares were sold to Fiat. It remained a subsidiary of Fiat until the mid-2010s. He drives a Fiat 128. When it comes to cars, you can't fool a Ferrari. Number two, Dino's death. Right. I did everything. Table showing what calories he could eat. What went in, what came out. In the movie, Enzo and his wife Laura are grieving the death of their son Dino. His absence hangs heavily over the film, providing narrative momentum and character development. And sadly, it's accurate. And Dino's death, of course, was a, it was a shattering blow to him and to his wife. Alfredo Dino Ferrari was born in 1932 and was close with his father, even working under him as an engineer. But Dino fell ill and was eventually diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. He was cared for by Enzo, but the disease claimed his life in 1956 at just 24. While he was in the hospital, Dino discussed the technical details of an engine with his father. Ferrari later produced this engine, which was named after Dino. Completely love the experience. I'm feeling the car a lot more raw without so many systems, without so much technology. You really feel what's underneath you. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications.
Number 1. Ferrari's Risk of Going Out of Business Wrong The film hangs the entire future of Ferrari on the 1957 Mille Miglia. If Ferrari doesn't win, it will go out of business. You're going broke. So what do I do? Win the Mille Miglia, Enzo. Or you are out of business. But according to Luca Dal Monte, author of Enzo Ferrari, Power, Politics, and the Making of an Automotive Empire, this is, quote, totally inaccurate. The company wasn't what it is today, but Ferrari was still in a pretty good place. Laura, what do you want me to say? Mr. Ford, we have a deal, but first I must wait until I ask my wife for permission? Yes, you can say that. As Del Monte explains, the late 1950s was, quote, not a particularly hard time for Ferrari, thanks in large part to streetcar sales and Italy's post-war economic boom. In Del Monte's own words, quote, I understand that this could make a good story, but it's not necessarily accurate. I don't have half a million. You will if you make a deal. Do you care about historical accuracy in films? Let us know in the comments below. You were supposed to save him! You blame me for his death? Yes! Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.